Hello, this is Michael Beers, West Coast editor for Jam Magazine, and I'm with the pioneer of the te technique known as tap-in, affectionately referred to as maestro, Steve Hackett. Steve, thank you so much for taking the time, sir. Wow, so here nice we are. Thank you. Thank you. Genesis Revisited. Um, yeah. This is your fourth tour of Genesis Revisited, and this time it's a special treat you're doing Selling England by the Pound in its entirety. Yep. Um, I believe that if you received a dollar for every time you're asked what your favorite Genesis album was, you tell them something by the pound, you could retire years ago. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it is still my, my favorite uh, uh, Genesis album. Um, it's from a time when uh, John Lennon said that Genesis was one of the bands that he was listening to, so uh, I'm still proud of that, if you know what I mean. It's, uh, and you know, one of those uh, things that you can't buy, you know what I mean? That's right. And, and when the Genesis released the album, they did a, they embarked on a massive tour of, of Europe and the United States. Yep. And my understanding is they did six tracks from the album. Uh, I Know What I Like, More Fool Me, Cinema Show, Firth of Fifth, Battle of Epping Forest, and Dancing with the Moonlit Night. Of these six tracks, what yep. was the one song you were just savoring, you were just, you know, relishing to perform live because you go, this song is going to turn a lot of heads. Well, I think that um, I've thought about that a lot over the years and um, I think the amount of surprises that are there in Dancing with the Moon at Night is the one that makes it uh, the standout track for me because it goes through so many changes and it's such a thoroughly group written song uh, for all sorts of reasons, I think it was uh, groundbreaking then and I can't think of anyone who's done anything remotely like him. It's not generic, it goes through uh, many different styles from Scottish playing songs, the influence of um, something anthemic, a little bit of Elgarian, uh, the land of hope and glory references, very British, but then it goes into, um, into fusion and um, before the, 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 the term was coined. So it goes into musical pyrotechnics that are very, um, uh, I think they were probably groundbreaking at the time. Other people have, have, have said this. And when we were inducted into the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the band Fish um, was talking about that, the guitar work in particular on that track and um, mentioned not just the tapping, but sweet picking and not octave jumps, so um, it was a kind of a, a, a prototype of solos that were to follow um, where people were using the guitar as, as, as a box of tricks, but then I think the track is so much more than that, you get a hint of Mozart with the, with the Mellotron voices, you get, um, I think you get more than a hint of Prokofiev with the uh, Mellotron cellos and um, distorted piano. Uh, you know, which just kind of propels it along in, in such a kind of unstoppable way. And then right at the end of it, you get the kind of um, almost uh, hypnotic, a kind of la-la land acceptance of what was going to follow in, in the future, the idea of, of the end of individuality and the end of the corner shop and the progression of the multinational um, and that's indeed what's happened to the British um, high street, you know, it's, whereas at one time it was the corner sweet shop, the candy store, what you now have is chains, just as, as has happened here, and in places as far away as China, when we were in China, Joe and I, we were seeing you know, brands that you, that you recognize over here, so even Beijing is not is not China anymore. It's um, it's it's that feeling of the conglomerate has taken over, just like they said in the in the movie uh, Network all those years ago. Um, mm. There are no more countries. Right. There are there are multinationals. Nice. You know, I, I see too. You have a recently released album, The Edge of Light. Yeah, and uh, I've noticed you used to have Gary O'Toole was in your band for many many years because yeah. a part of your nucleus he appeared on one track but you had yeah. a multitude of other drummers but I believe yes. now you have Craig Blundell as your drummer yes that's right well my preamble question is this over the years you've played with some of the most phenomenal drummers ever recorded and live Phil Collins Bill Bruford Chester Thompson uh, Phil Ernst of Kansas Gary Husband Ian Mosley 
Simon Phillips. For you, Steve, to yep. get a drummer in your band, what characteristics and traits do you look for in a drummer that you think are gonna highlight and accent the Hackett sound? Well, um, I think the thing that I was always looking for with drummers, um, uh, when I first joined Genesis, I had an amp that I thought was pretty loud. And then just the sound of Phil Collins acoustically, with, you know, without being mic'd up, it seemed hugely loud to me. And um, he just exploded into life in, um, in rehearsals, rehearsal rooms. And I was always looking for a similar quality. In other words, a guy starts up on the drums and he's four feet away from me and it's a, a, an explosion going on. And, and I saw that with the young uh, Jonathan Mover and Hugo Dagenhart, in addition to all the drummers that, that you've mentioned. So um, uh, I think, first of all, you're looking for fire if, you, if you're looking for rock drumming. And then, um, again, it depends what genre you're talking about. Um, or British drummers uh, in jazz. I remember seeing Winston Clifford on a couple of occasions and thinking he was absolutely extraordinary, taking it right down to finger clicks. A very small kit, but a huge amount of tones being produced from um, uh, one snare drum. And I've seen this as well when I've worked with percussionists in South America, where poverty often means that people can't afford oil rigs uh, what they have is, you know, one man, one drum, and they'll learn to get as many different sounds out of that one drum as possible. It's much the same philosophy that I, I employ with uh, acoustic guitar, nylon guitar, for instance. Try and get as many sounds as you can uh, out of it. Everyone makes a different sound on that. Are you taking a, a, a percussive approach, or um, are you impersonating... Um, acoustic instruments. Um, are you trying to make it sound like a harp? Are you making it sound like a glockenspiel, a cello? All of those things. So it's just a case of, of your of your perception of the instrument, your orientation of it. 